Today, I'm pleased to lead the conversation about the impact that the events of 2020, especially the coronavirus pandemic, had on our perceptions of security in personal, national and international dimension. My guest in this conversation is Thomas Kleine Brockhoff, Vice President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and Head of its Berlin office. Thomas is one of the leading voices in transatlantic security debate in Germany, in Europe and between the old continent and the United States. I've met Thomas a few years ago and I was lucky to take part in many events, conferences and workshops where I've learned that he always offers in-depth, very thoughtful, mature analysis of events and trends, as well as excellent, sharp and remarkably bright conclusions, with a pinch of optimism, so much needed in this gloom time of pandemic uh, world. So, Thomas Kleine Brockhoff, welcome to Politica Insights Risks and Trends 2021. Thank you, Marek, also for this very kind introduction. Happy to have you with us. For the start, let's take a few steps back from the headlines, policies and politics. Uh, and let's look in people's minds. Let's compare the two shocks that we've witnessed to uh, our perception of, of security that we've witnessed in the recent few years. 2014 was a year of shock in terms of military aggression happening just outside our borders uh, at our doorstep, frightful, especially to those who live near the aggressor, but not necessarily so to the rest of Europe, uh, let alone the rest uh, of the world. This time it is much different. The year 2020 brought the real and present danger to everyone's life and instantly this was reflected in opinions. The most feared security threat was immediately related to the pandemics, health systems, illness prevention and care, not those uh, related to military uh, issues which were so dominant uh, not long time ago. And also the climate catastrophe was sort of marginalized in the threat perception polls. Is this change an element of, of this shock which will pass as soon as the pandemic eases, or could it permanently change people's thinking and also the political decision about what does it mean to be secure? In other words, how deep will be the impact of 2020? Um, essentially, there's a number of schools on, 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 this, on this question. Um, one of the schools is sort of, let's call it the 9-11 school. So the, the world has permanently changed. This is a fork in the road. Nothing will ever be the same from our, uh, the, the way we communicate to the way we interact politically with each other. The second uh, school is the, is the trend accelerator school, that this trend um, that this this uh, this incident, the coronavirus, um, accelerates already existing uh, trend trends, and then there is a smaller school who who will say that at some point the quality of a, a gradual change accelerating existing changes uh, is qualitatively so different that we find ourselves in the new in the new world. Let me say something counterintuitive. There are elements where this crisis, the current crisis, will, in my view, play less of a role than we currently think. <coughs> we had forgotten all about the Spanish flu um, in 1919, 1920, because what we remember is World War I, but not the Spanish flu. We also don't remember that the, the roaring 20s that followed have something to do with the combination of, 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 of the two and, and a burst of optimism and joy in life. So I could very well imagine that uh, the corona pandemic of, of 2020 is nothing like the Black Death of 1348, um, which 
is with us in our collective memories even 700 years later. Um, but that we would rather see the Spanish flu, that we have to dig up, uh, dig up history books in order to find out what really happened in 2020. So I, I, th I see a, a, an element of snapback that we will have once we have the vaccine effective globally, which will might take another year or even more. But that there is the trend accelerator uh, that, that, will, um, that will be with us because there will have been changes induced, changes induced by this crisis that will, that will be there to last and that will be there to affect us for a much longer period of time. And the most important one of those is the change of guard and the change of power, the transfer of power, the uh, the growth and uh, growing assertiveness of China. You can call it a trend uh, accelerator, but I would call it an, a, a war in a new dimension, because what we have seen in this 2020 was, you know, alliances cracking, great powers declining, and governments, even, you know, the super rich uh, governments of, of nations and, and blocks of nations, all of a sudden caught dependent on, you know, very basic but crucial supplies. And what we have seen is competition growing, even though you know, at times we could see uh, cooperation expanding. So tell me, is this a, a manifestation of a new a dimension of international competition or is it something that would actually um, strengthen cooperation? For instance, in case of the European Union, we could see something like a roller coaster of decisions uh, and, and criticism of those uh, decisions. And we're not yet, of course, through this, this process to see w what we will end up with. But my impression from 2020 is that this could lead to a new wave of international competition rather than cooperation. Yes, you would think that a pandemic is the, um, it, it is the ultimate example of international cooperation because only through uh, international cooperation can you beat the virus and only if we beat it everywhere we have we will have beaten it somewhere and even if you think that you need to act first for your own population you cannot control a mutant of the virus somewhere in Brazil and it's going to reach our shores even if we think we've already beat it. So this is the, 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 the paradigm of the distribution of global public goods um, that is needed. But what we see is the opposite. We see, again, in my view, a trend accelerator. We have seen peak globalization a couple of years ago. Now we see an acceleration of deglobalization. Um, the EU's decision this past week to enact export controls uh, for, for vaccines is part of that story. Um, the initial border closures, unilateral border closures, not cooperative uh, uh, um, uh, border closures, or part of that story as well. So what I think we're, we're seeing is the idea that there is a sort of globalization taken too far is, take, is taken hold. And the question now is whether we will go towards protectionism and autonomy and, init and, and finally autarky. Those, th those are the terms that describe the slippery slope or whether we um, go towards something that Pascal Lamy has, has termed uh, precautionism, that does accept uh, globalization, that does uh, accept the division of labor the, as a principle, but that does, on the other hand, um, um, sort of question the principle of just-in-time delivery, and therefore um, it, it talks about stockpiling talks about uh, a broader array of, of distribution, so, uh, distribution sources, a broader sourcing of uh, that keeps globalization alive,
but combines it with the idea that there can be shocks to the system and that one has to be prepared to deal with the shocks to the system. So I would hope the latter is where we're going, but clearly the European Union is a good example of a roller coaster ride between uh, between the two. It has been part of an, a, a main a, a main supporter of COVAX, the the international um, alliance to vaccinate, including the global south. But on the other hand, it's been uh, it's been uh, twice now introducing export controls as a last measure. Now, I don't think, and I'll close with, with that thought, that internationalism should be defined that you vaccinate somebody else before you vaccinate your own people. If that is the threshold of internationalism, internationalism is going to necessarily fail. I think one should define as the airplanes define. If you have the masks coming down in a case of oxygen failure in a in a plane the flight attendant will tell you please put put the mask over your nose then take care of your neighbor so i think there is an, a definition of internationalism that needs to be more realistic and more congruent with human nature than what we sometimes expect of ourselves it is impossible to discuss the impact of 2020 in terms of security perceptions without looking at america the world's superpower, who is wounded, bleeding, and at times at the verge of revolution. The, the contrast between the bombastic rhetoric of the last four years and the collapse of the system as we've seen it, primarily the, the death toll, w was striking not only for the outside lookers, the, the rest of the world, but also it must have been uh, a wake-up call for very many Americans. Uh, or was it? I mean, Thomas, you, you, you know the American soul much better than, than me. Is there going to be a reflection on the other side of the Atlantic about what does it mean to really be secure and what does it really mean to be the most powerful nation in the world? Most certainly. Um, America is, has always been an island of security that has seen itself unaffected by by global trends, uh, protected by oceans, uh, protected by only two and two friendly neighbors, and th the two most important shocks to the system uh, were Pearl Harbor and 9-11, uh, where, where the US was affected on its shores, um, and one was even the island off its shores. Um, so this this virus will probably affect the collective psyche of the uh, of the United States more than the collective psyche of countries that are connected with other countries by land masses. So I do think that the American uh, the American mind w will have a more long lasting effect uh, of this than uh, than other countries. But the question is how. Uh, I, I think the the, the, some people argue that this um, is an attack on the idea of American exceptionalism. It is certainly something that um, undermines the American model of global leadership and global leadership um, as, as an exemplary country. Um, that, I think, will be, will be affected. And it also tells Americans who have a history of, of extreme changes from one, uh, one, from one outlook to the other, and also of mood changes of, of as you said it in your question, of a bombastic rhetoric of grandiose achievement to, um, to a complete self-assessment of failure. We've seen that multiple times over the, la over the last decades, including the post-Vietnam War, but it also tells you that America usually recovers from these from, uh, from these waves uh, of of collective depression that clearly America is in now. Based on what we said just moments ago, it seems legitimate to say that this may emphasize the trends in America, which lead to more isolationism 
more inward looking policies. Even the, um, the bottom line of the new administration is build back better, build at home to be better also outside. We used to think that isolationist ideas in the United States were sort of automatically linked to the presidency of Donald Trump in the you know, past four years. But is it really so? There's a very good new book out on that question, Charlie Kupchin's uh, book on American isolationism, uh, that recounts the history of, uh, of isolationism and uh, how America has fared well uh, uh, with it for 100 years or, or longer, that only in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the first challenges uh, to the American isolationism arose, and it is no coincidence that the first attempt to internationalize uh, Woodrow Wilson's attempt failed. Um, and only in, in the end, Pearl Harbor changed uh, uh, that outlook. So we have to take into account that there is an element of self-sufficiency in American uh, in, in in the American collective mind uh, that is popular. In America, that we've seen reemerge over the last years, um, but the question is: Is that isolationism, or will it lead to isolationism, or is it the correction of a previous overreach? Because the unilateral moment uh, that we that we recall is the first time in world history in which uh, there was liberal hegemony; that there was the um, the ability of the liberal democracy to call the shots globally led by the United States. Now that was a very short, very brief, and one could arguably say not very successful moment. And that we are now seeing um, an element of correction that is limitation. Of course that is driven by sort of an isolationist core. Will it lead to uh, isolationism, I'm not so sure, because the, 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 the slogan that you have just quoted with, uh, with um, Joe Biden, build back better, also applies in his mind to alliances. He wants to build back the alliances better. Uh, precondition of that is that you have a trusted, trustworthy and functioning government at home. So what I see is rather not an American problem, but I see a Western problem. I see the same erosion of trust in our governments and the same sense of overstretch in, in, in many of our democratic societies. I believe we're in that same boat together. So America, at least for the moment, and at least in the initial narratives of the new administration, is back uh, and perhaps even in need to be backed by, by its allies. But let's, let's get back to Europe, uh, which may have been less wounded by the pandemic than America, but, sh but which will face equally important dilemmas about its security. And just uh, everybody in Europe seems to be aware that Europe needs to do more, more swiftly, more cohesively, in dealing with uh, health threats, uh, as well as as well as um, there is a growing re growing realization that Europe needs to generally do more uh, uh, for its defense. Um, this is also the major subject of uh, transatlantic uh, uh, discussions. America's growing engagement and focus on on Asia which results or may result in less engagement and less presence in, in Europe. And let's face it, the growing disagreements, strategic disagreements about uh, the role of Europe in the global uh, sphere versus or um, with the United States. All these combined seem to be pushing Europe to go its own way, maybe not yet uh, go alone. Is it possible to keep the transatlantic bond uh, on one hand and have some strategic autonomy on the other? Uh, or will Europe inevitably over time become a competitor uh, to the United States? No, I don't believe that's 
our future. Uh, it, we, we shouldn't want this to be our uh, our future. I'm not a very I'm not a very happy camper when it comes to the term strategic autonomy uh, and uh, and European sovereignty. We're in an age of renationalization. Nobody uh, wants to transfer power in Europe to the supranational level, except for a very few and uh, who, who would be willing, but you can't get a European consensus for just about anything if it, if it comes with transferring sovereignty to the European level. So first of all, the term implies a very lax definition, intellectually lax definition of sovereignty. If sovereignty means capability and ability to act, I'm fully on board. We need to do that for, in order to be a good partner of the United States, to even be useful to the United States and be useful to ourselves, more importantly. Um, but capability and capacity and willingness and ability to act are different from sovereignty. Sovereignty runs the danger, at least as conceived of by those who propose it, of putting Europe into a strategic no man's land, somewhere between China, Russia, and the United States. And that, I think, is the danger of the concept. Economically, it speaks to, um, to protectionism, mercantilism, um, in the end, autonomy. That's why some people who've understood that are now talking, talking about open uh, uh, strategic autonomy to exclude the idea that this is a protectionist idea. So I think it's an ill-conceived idea that gets us nowhere. We need to to think about our own ability to act in unison and our own ability to act in unison together with the United States. Just as I believe that there is no problem that the United States has alone that we have that we have shared uh, problems, I believe that the solution to these problems will come from from Western democracies and not from singular singling out Europe. And without a solution to our deep crisis of trust within our populations, within the the biggest and largest and most traditional of our democracies, I also think we will find a good solution in Europe itself. So we're joined at the hip as democracies, uh, and the challenges we faced are joint challenges, and we better uh, we we better band together on this because the fragility of democracy has shown us that it's better to stick together as democracies. I know that you are not uh, uh, a, a fan of this term, st uh, strategic autonomy, and forgive me, it may have been a little provocation from my side to uh, allow you to, to express your criticism um, of the term. But I would like you to help me decipher the other part of this uh, equation, that is, what does it mean that Europe needs to do more on security and defense? Uh, exactly who should do what, when, uh, and in what sense more? I, I think what we need is a new consensus and a new bargain transatlantically. And that consensus and bargain needs to be an updated uh, Atlantic consensus. And that consensus needs to be translated into a new world. And that translation, in my view, uh, in pr on principle, goes something like this. I America renews with the new presidency its commitment to European defense. A and that is largely an Article 5 commitment, but it also has a nuclear component of nuclear sharing, of deterrence. While the Europeans uh, take on the task of what I, I don't call it burden sharing, I would like to call it burden shifting. Uh, the Europeans need to be able to do two things. One is to deter conventional uh, attack on the European homeland, uh, and that is conventional homeland territorial defense. And the burden of that goes to the larger European land-based countries, and I mean my own country first and foremost. Now, that is the country most lacking that commitment and lacking 
uh, that insight and lacking the willingness to make progress quickly. It has made progress. It has made even significant progress in turning the tide, but nowhere close to what is necessary. I always feel that the Germans are moving, but the environment is moving faster. So the gap, gap keep, keeps growing, even though the Germans feel they're moving. Um, so that is the but it's not just a German phenomenon. When you look at the smaller European countries, they often hide in their defense uh, uh, in their defense quotas behind Germany. Uh, there's only very few countries who actually do what they've promised to do in Europe. So we need to be able to do that in order to relieve America of uh, of of some of its duties in Europe. That, by the way, also means some adjustment of its perspective on the uh, on the part of Poland. It needs to become more reliant on its European uh, on its European partners and the European partners also need to provide that. Uh, so I think that in conventional terms, that's the uh, that's the that's the deal. Then the second part of the deal concerns China. Um, uh, I, I, I think there is different interests overlapping, but in some elements, different interests vis-a-vis -vis China in Europe than in the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. But we can converge on those. We, I think, need to accept that there are security caveats and technology caveats to our trade with China. And America needs to accept that from a European perspective, uh, two things are important. One, a complete decoupling is unrealistic and probably dangerous. Uh, and uh, the European defense commitment to, uh, to China is a far-fetched idea. But what we should want to do is support and understand and do no harm to uh, the American concern vis-a-vis -vis China. So there needs to be an alignment on China that respects uh, these differences in, in national and continental interests. We will speak about China in a moment, but I would like just um, uh, one more thing about the um, doing more for security and defense in Europe. Um, you, you did not mention the magic number, the 2%. Is this debate over now with um, the farewell of uh, President Trump? Uh, or the Biden administration will reshape the uh, debate on, commitment, on commitments? Um, as a German in my country, uh, I would say Donald Trump has successfully killed 2%. I don't know of a single politician who would go out into his constituency and defend 2% uh, on, 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 the, on the assumption that this is what America is demanding. First of all, that's the wrong definition. It's not America. We've all committed to two German governments have. Um, but that's a perception. It's something that people can no longer invest political capital into. So the framing, in my view, has to be changed. And the way one can change it is to say, we've made that commitment uh, in the summits in 2014 and, and subsequently. 10 years on, let's look at where what we've come and what we need today. And what we should be doing is to look at NATO capability and defense planning and look at the commitments on substance there that we are able to fulfill those. Those commitments, by the way, that my country has taken go far beyond the 2024 deadline and are largely uh, uh, larger uh, in, in scope and go, go towards 2031. Now, I don't ask for a rebate for anybody, including for my own country, but, I, uh, but what I think would be politically helpful is is to shape and change the debate towards what we really what we really need and what the, how the needs have changed during the last 10 years what we will also need to account for and that is the most difficult piece of the future capabilities debate is how do you uh, account for covid 
during the last crisis, 20, uh, 2008, the financial crisis, European defense capabilities thereafter declined by 30 percent uh, in the time of austerity that followed. What are we going to do uh, post-COVID, where we've spent a deficit spent uh, as if there was no tomorrow? So we're going to need to bring a line, a line the uh, the defense necessities with uh, w with the the budget constraints in order to avoid this type of a dramatic drop. Exactly, this question will probably emerge in the following months, since you have uh, your election campaign uh, for the federal Bundestag in in Germany, and this is widely perceived as one of the key decisions that Europe uh, faces in the post-COVID world. In other words, how to convince Germans and other nations in Europe that defense still matters and security has also these other dimensions that we've spoken about uh, at the beginning than your health and uh, health system security? I, I believe people are attentive to international affairs these days. They understand, and everybody understands, although they can't sometimes sort of, sort of see the sources and connect the dots between them, the obvious deterioration of the international climate. They see the struggles of the United States. They see the the increasing assertiveness and totalitarian nature of China, and they have no doubts about the nature of Putin's Russia, uh, um, and they also see the the opposition to uh, uh, to Vladimir Putin. So I think the environment is relatively clear to people, and the idea that one wants to have a government. Um, that can freely take decision rather than be pressured by others, uh, I, I think is an idea that people understand clearly, that you better do this jointly, and that actually there's a, there's a, there's a benefit to be had from banding together with our European and transatlantic friends. I think these are, are, are ideas that are easy to convey. Um, we have to reframe them in order and and update them and gear them towards the issues of the uh, of the day in order to make them to make our politicians want to invest in these ideas so you think that 2021 will be the uh, year and time of redefinition of the common approach both in Europe and between Europe and the United States versus climate change versus China versus Russia and other these major security dilemmas on the table? The Biden administration opens the door to that. It's a, we've had a climate skeptic as a president. We have a, you could say, a climate activist um, as, as a president. He have an, an, a nationalist is followed by an internationalist. Uh, somebody who thought uh, alliances were a burden uh, to the United States, followed by somebody who believes that alliances are a force multiplier. So I could go on with the, these types. So I, I, I think you mentioned the three major elements of this. There is a climate activism coming out of the uh, of the Biden. It means that is, by the way, coupled with a social justice uh, a drive, a drive towards the stabilization of democracy. I would call that the so the, the the liberal, the left liberal element of 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 the package that we're that we're seeing. But that is combined with a more conservative element which is the, the strong security uh, emphasis, the strong emphasis on, um, on looking at revisionist great powers as China and as Russia as for what they are. So I, I see a convergence of the, let's call it old security topics, the old and traditional and relevant security topics updated by the world environment and a, a, a set of new topics 
that the Biden administration um, brings forward. And that, by the way, uh, should attract, uh, uh, certainly in, in, in some European countries, constituencies that have been uh, full of critique of the United States over the past, uh, over the past several years. For you in, in Berlin, one of the most striking images of 2020 must have been this incapacitated man transferred from uh, Russia to, uh, to Germany, uh, poisoned by the security agents of, of the Kremlin, who then managed to sort of rise from the half dead, uh, expose his his might have been killers, exposed the um, uh, corrupt, uh, corruptive mechanisms of, uh, of Kremlin and, and Vladimir Putin. And now the man who is probably <laughs> behind the uh, most uh, widely widespread demonstrations uh, of Russia's uh, oppositions uh, throughout the country. Um, on the other hand, you still uh, see and hear the voices in Europe uh, and also some in the United States and elsewhere that, you know, you need to deal with Russia and you need to have Russia on board on major issues like the New Start, uh, for instance. So tell me, is there a way to deal with Russia? knowing that Vladimir Putin has probably uh, ordered the politically motivated assassination uh, and yet talk to him uh, as an equal partner? First of all, I'll have to say that the, the beauty of, of politics sometimes is that, in, like, like under the microscope, can you see the nature of things and the Navalny case enables you to do that. We see clearly the nature of the current regime in its dealing with Navalny and we see the true Russia on the streets. So should, we should be very careful in how we assess our relationship with Russia. I think the true Russia is the one that we've seen in the cold. Uh, or at least part of a good part of Russia is the part of Russia that has been asking for change and for participation and for democracy in the past in the past days. Uh, and I would hope that there are some some signs of solidarity with the Russian people, not with the Russian regime. So let's talk about the Putin regime rather than about Russia in, in our way we deal with them. Now, um, I, I've said for a number of years, sometimes to the to 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 the amazement of my uh, of my conversation partners, that I know a way how better to deal with the Putin regime, and that is if Germany does two percent for a number of years, because that will enable us to have an eye to eye conversation of many things that we uh, that we care about, and we should care. We can only work and deal with. Uh, with an autocrat like Putin uh, from a position of strength. A position of strength enables us to do uh, a few things that we need to do. Arms control is one. We need to get the Russians on board to get the Chinese on board in order to have a future of the JCPOA or some future agreement with Iran on weapons. We need the Russians on board. We need to prevent a, a Turkish uh, a Turkish-Russian alignment that will be that will be dangerous for uh, for Europe and destabilizing for the Middle East. I could go on in topics that no matter who leads Russia, we need Russia to be engaging with. But we need to do it with clear eyes and and limited expectations. I think there is until and unless there is a democratic uh, 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 Russia. The, our agenda will be strategic and it will be limited. 
Everything else we've seen from the modernization partnership, a term that the German policy planning staff at one time in invented, to all the offers, especially my country has made, and now the French have been making, uh, uh, have been rejected. It takes two to tango. The Russians have chosen and are choosing to go a different route, and 2014 is a good indication uh, of that route. You will probably expect that question from Poland. What about the Nord Stream 2 then? I can't explain Nord Stream 2 to you, please, please, I apologize. Um, uh, we probably have the most clear-eyed chancellor when it comes to Russia uh, that we've had in a while and probably will have looking at the candidates uh, for chancellorship. And I cannot possibly explain to you how she uh, combines the clear-eyedness of, of her view to, uh, w with this decision. Um, I have a guess, but that's all I have. What, what I will say is this. We need to move. There is a time beyond Nord Stream 2. There is a time either when it... Uh, uh, when it is built or when it is not finished. We need, to, we need to think now about energy security in Central and Eastern Europe, about energy cooperation of Central and Eastern Europe with Germany, and we need to find mechanisms to, be, uh, to move beyond this corrosive uh, uh, difference of opinion in order to be able to look to other important issues. This is eroding our relationships and both sides, no matter what the outcome, need to start looking beyond and look for ways to repair the damage that has been made. Let's get, let's get back to the impact of 2020 as our time is, is uh, slowly ending. If we were talking um, a year ago, we would have probably started with the Chinese, Chinese uh, virus, later, later known as SARS-CoV-2. Uh, to me, one of the greatest uh, impacts of 2020 is the level of scrutiny uh, that was applied on China as the result uh, of the uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, before that, China was a matter for experts, for journalists, for people in the um, um, decision-making uh, circles. Now it's almost a matter for everybody because of the virus. People hear about all other mechanisms and decisions and actions of the Chinese government clamped out on democracy in Hong Kong, the aggressiveness on the South China Sea, the plight of Uyghurs uh, deemed as, as genocide by the United States. So uh, is, is, the, um, is China one year later a winner or a loser of 2020? Or it's too early to call? Um, well, there's elements that you uh, that you can determine. We, we are all China would like to see itself and portray itself as the winner uh, from that because it it claims it and only it has been able to deal with uh, with the virus appropriately, while these misgoverned democracies are una unable to. Uh, there I'd like to point the Chinese to their Taiwanese democratic neighbors. I would like to point them to their South Korean democratic neighbors. Uh, I'd like to even point them to their, to their Singaporean neighbors. So there's something about the awareness of acting early on, on, uh, on, on a virus like this that comes from previous pandemic uh, experience that the East Asians have. So I don't think there is a specific Asia, uh, Chinese element to this, and there's certainly not a Chinese authoritarianism element that enables to deal with a, a virus uh, appropriately. 
Uh, secondly, they'd like to think that they have uh, stepped up in the ladder towards global dominance uh, in, the, in the last year. Well, I, 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 there I'd also like to throw a little monkey wrench into the, uh, into the Chinese uh, uh, analyses. I think we've seen peak globalization. But we've also, if we, if the principle of precautionism is adopted, many companies will ask themselves whether further investment, further deepening, more dependency on China is the most prudent course to go. So in terms of foreign direct investment, China will, will suffer greatly. Uh, from from uh, from this from this pandemic, so uh, I I think there is countervailing forces to the narrative that the Chinese are the w winners from uh, from uh, from this uh, from this pandemic. We tend to think that the year 2020 was uh, something called the Annus Horribilis, uh, a a terrible year, a terrible time, and that it couldn't get much worse. But with those elements that you've mentioned throughout this conversation, with the challenges to redefine transatlanticism, to uh, get a new approach to China, to finally get together on, on climate change, and with the still unknown situation about this pandemic, um, what could get worse in 2021? Because, you know, my impression is that the previous year has proven that we need to be uh, prepared for things to get worse before they uh, get better. So what's your uh, lookout for 2020 year, uh, 21 and beyond? Clearly, the, the, we've seen over the past several years that it can get worse and that every year in terms of global cooperation and 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 systemic stability has been worse than uh, than the previous year so i wouldn't exclude that 2021 is that we've seen that we haven't bottomed out bottomed out yet and the indication of the failure of the european union in terms of vaccination procurement, uh, the anxieties and impatience of European populations, the finger pointing at Brussels bode very well to European cooperation because the, the, the first time the argument of the Brexiteers of taking back control has panned out because they can say if we had we been member of the European Union, we wouldn't have a, a larger proportion of our people vaccinated yet. And that is, by the way, true for this country as well, where people ask, why is a vaccine that was invented in this country not available in this country? Um, so I, I think we have seen, we are seeing elements and dangers of disintegration uh, still increasing. But we're also seeing uh, a countervailing uh, elements. We're seeing a sense of normalcy in the United States, an element of, of government normalcy that the Biden administration is, is trying to project. Usually these things, well, just as in the Trump administration, take years to take, uh, to take real effect and to take visible effect. Usually at the beginning of the year, which we are now, one looks at the threat assessment and, uh, on the, of the coming year. And you've done that. You've just asked me for the threat assessment for 2021. In times like these, where the threats are abound, I'd like to turn this around, Mark, if you allow me. I'd like to say, what are the factors of stabilization? What are the lighthouses, the islands? What islands are there? What islands can we build? How can you connect the islands uh, of, of, uh, of stability. And so sort of that to me is the, is the question that politicians and policymakers should be concerned, uh, should be concerned about uh, and to, to, to invest into stabilization mechanism. And the Biden administration offers such an opportunity. By the way, also its return 
to multilateral instruments from the Paris Accord to the WHO. Let's not forget the United States invested four billion in by in by joining COVAX, the vac the International Vaccination Alliance. The next step would have to be, in my view, to look at the dispute resolution mechanism of the WTO. Uh, we will need to revive the idea of of democracies acting together in the G7 or some other instrument as the British propose a D10 or the Americans seem to be toying around with the idea of a double quad, an Asian plus a European quad under American leadership. So we need to think about the instruments of, of, of jointly coordinating policy in a time of destabilization in order to build what I call these lighthouses of or islands of stability in a sea of, of, of change and, and up, uh, upheaval. So that was the dose of this optimistic realism that I've mentioned at the beginning that you yes, were probably you, going to offer. Threat, Mavek, I'd like to uh, turn it around and talk about the opportunities coming out of, out of this. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for this. Thank you for this conversation. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, very much for the time you spent in front of your screen. I encourage you to watch other recordings from this year's Risks and Trends. I would also like to thank the partners of this year's conference.